Um, hello and welcome everybody to our mini symposium, Anomalous Energy Transfer at the Nanoscale, which is a continuation of the plenary lectures, the four nice plenary lectures we heard this morning. And um, before we start, I would like to say a few words why we initiated this mini symposium. As a matter of fact, this mini symposium is a collaboration between Professor Griftsov and Professor Borobov. And this is because um, with these two people uh, at the St. Petersburg Polytechnic University, we at the Technical University of Berlin, to which I belong, Wolfgang Müller, we have a collaboration. And as part of this collaboration, an international grant was given to us from the RSF and from our German Science Foundation. So I would like to uh, acknowledge our support and thank very much for the opportunity to make it possible that today we are going to present some results from this joint research here at the mini symposium. We have several speakers and without further ado, I would like to uh, ask to the podium, um, Kovaleva, Margarita Kovaleva. It is a joint paper with Shagin Yang Shagen and, Manievich, and Leonid Manievich. The title of their presentation is Energy Transport and Nonlinear Waves in Nonlinear Discrete Chains. They come from Moscow, from the NN Semyonov Federal Research Center of Chemical Physics and from the Russian Academy of Sciences. Please begin with your lecture. You are not very loud. You have to speak up so that the people outside can hear you. Yeah, yeah, the uh, presentation. Okay, just one moment. Probably it would be better if you sit near the uh, Let's see. I hope uh, you can hear me better now. When I'm closer to the computer. Thank you very much. It is now a little better when you are closer to the computer. Thank you. Please begin. So uh, today, today I would like to tell. Uh, today I would like to uh, tell uh, about uh, the work that is the results of work of of, uh, of different stages, and uh, there were different collaborators in this work. So I have to say that. Um, uh, the colleagues uh, who are listed, uh, the co-authors, uh, so the list is not exactly um, as you mentioned. However, I will mention uh, which work was done in collaboration with uh, different researchers. And uh, today I will talk about the energy transport and nonlinear waves. So, however, I will talk mostly about the regular energy transport, which means that I will not talk, talk about the stochasticity, for example. And I would like to dedicate my talk to my teacher who passed away last summer and uh, who, was, uh, uh, who was the leader of the lab that I'm uh, leading now uh for a couple of years and uh, he inspired uh, this research uh, however the end of the research was finished already after his death and um 
motivation of this work was uh, um, to, uh, to study the high amplitude dynamics. So the transfer of the uh, more energy that is normally studied in the, in the nonlinear chains. So we do all know that it is easier to study quasi-linear chains, linear or quasi-linear chains, because in such objects, we can uh, easily um, make some uh, assumptions uh, of, the, uh, of the motion being close to some linear frequencies and so on. However, if we deal with the strongly nonlinear systems, or if we deal with the systems where the uh, frequencies uh, strongly depend on the amplitudes, then we cannot use the linearization procedure or some uh, quasi-linear approaches. And uh, the goal was to develop approach which could be valid for different types of nonlinearity for high amplitude dynamics and uh, uh, to investigate the uh, nonlinear, uh, not only on site nonlinearity, but also nonlinear coupling effect. So uh, normally when we, so when we uh, look at the energy transfer, uh, we remember first thing that we remember is the uh, beating phenomena, which is well known, which we all know from our school days. And uh, this means that if we got two oscillators, one of which is excited and another one is in uh, is uh, um, uh, not excited, then if we add a weak coupling, the energy starts to transfer from one part of this very short chain to another, and then vice versa. This is the beating phenomenon. And uh, there, due to weak coupling, the two scale of time appear. One is the scale of the fast oscillations. And another one is the slow time scale, which uh, describes the, uh, the energy evolution. And then we proceed to the, uh, to the approach uh, how, to, um, how to deal with the energy uh, transport in some uh, finite dimension systems. So normally, we, when we discuss uh, some system with uh, weak nonlinearity, uh, then we do see uh, for the same initial conditions when only one of the oscillators is initially excited, we uh, see intensive energy exchange between the two oscillators. We see uh, both fast oscillations and the slow, uh, slow envelop function evolution. So we see the two time scales, which can be separated. However, to make this separation, we uh, use, uh, in the most of the approaches, we use the frequency of the fast oscillations. And uh, normally, if the oscillations are quasi-linear, we use the frequency of the linear oscillations, which are uh, seen in the equations. However, as we all know, so uh, then we can separate this, uh, these two types of motion and the slow evolution of the envelope function will tell us what happens with the energy. However, as we all know, in the strongly nonlinear systems, the, uh, the frequency of the linear oscillations can be significantly different from the frequency of the nonlinear oscillations. There are also systems where no linear frequency exists. Um, uh, this case is named normally acoustic vacuum. And uh, this means that some other approach should be developed for this kind of systems. And I will show you uh, how this approach was uh, uh, invented, checked, and how uh, did we use it for different types of systems. So, for the, uh, for the beginning, I will start with the um, one-dimensional system. This will be pendulum, which is the nonlinear system. 
uh, when we study the uh, when we study the low amplitude oscillations, then we can say that this system is quasi-linear, and then the quasi-linear approach uh, with use of the um, uh, with use of the uh, linear uh, or close to linear uh, frequency can be used. However, if we proceed uh, with the high amplitude oscillations, then uh, the this simple system demonstrates the strongly nonlinear um, evolution. And uh, I will tell here about the um, the parametric resonance which means that uh, we are uh, acting um, with the harmonic forcing on the station points. And we see that uh, at some frequency of the external forcing, the um, evolution significantly changes, even if the frequency of the forcing is uh, uh, changed uh, in a very tiny region. Uh, and at the left, you see the... Um, high amplitude response and to the right you see a very low amplitude response. So this was the formulation of the first um, of the first uh, problem and here we say that uh, we will um, use uh, the same procedure of the separation of the slow and fast uh, time scales. However, we will not say which will be the um, the frequency of the fast oscillation. We do not know it exactly, because it depends strongly on the amplitude of the response. And then uh, this, uh, then we do it um, in the equations. We uh, make one part, we separate one part which defines the fast oscillations at some frequency, which we do not define yet. And then we have the slow evolution of the rest, which will define the evolution of the envelope functions, which means the energy, which will be transferred from the external source to the oscillator and then the port. And uh, then we proceed to the asymptotic procedure where we proceed to the complex variables and a, using standard two-scale expansion uh, we obtain the equation of motion, uh, which, uh, which is complex now and which can be transferred to the conservative form. Uh, in this form, we can uh, proceed, we can find the um, integral of motion, uh, which is defined by letter H, and uh, then we can uh, separate the evolution on the amplitude and phase. So, uh, and then we separating the uh, uh, these uh, separating amplitude and phase in, uh, equations evolution, we can proceed to the phase plane analysis. And uh, at the phase plane, we can easily select which will be the response to, uh, depending on the initial conditions and on the um, external um, forcing frequency. And here we can say that uh, depending on the, uh, here S is defines the detuning uh, of the external forcing uh, to the linear uh, frequency of the uh, pendulum. And uh, here we see that uh, de depending on the uh, frequency, uh, there can be one or two stationary points and uh, one is stable, another one is unstable. And here we see what happens with the um, phase plane uh, depending on the frequency. So if we are, uh, or if we deal with the frequency uh, which is upper the resonance, then we see no stationary points, which means that each uh, trajectory which begins uh, uh, from the starting point in the vicinity of the zero uh, initial conditions will not be amplified. Then uh, when one stationary point appears, it will be um, settled, uh, sorry, it will be center. Then uh, there, uh, there appear uh, these trajectories which start from the vicinity of the zero initial conditions and then make amplification. Uh, these trajectories provide periodic 
uh, motion, and uh, this will be the parametry present. And then uh, one more stationary point appears when we go along the frequency range to the lower frequencies. And then we see that the new type of the point appears, the saddles. And the, the separate races which pass through the saddles um, do not allow the um, trajectories which begin from the vicinity of the zero initial conditions to be amplified. This means that the parametric resonance uh, is over. So uh, here I deal with the trajectory which starts from the zero initial conditions and it shows me if the resonance or the amplification will appear or not. This trajectory is named limiting phase trajectory because uh, if we only deal with this trajectory, we can completely describe the evolution of the resonance and the amplitude of the uh, resonating trajectory. So uh, we have found the instability region in our asymptotics and uh, compare this with the uh, exact solution of the instability region uh, given by the um, Mathieu equation. And here we see also uh, obtained by an, our analysis, analytically obtained the form of the limited phase trajectory for different, uh, for different frequencies of the uh, parametric forcing. And here we see that the amplitude of the limiting phase trajectory uh, defines the amplitude of the response. So, uh, and here uh, I give the comparison of the um, analytic solution, which can be obtained by the limiting phase trajectory, and uh, the uh, full solution, which is given by the dark red. Uh, and uh, here we see that um, the time of the entrance into the resonance is not is not captured. However, however, uh, the form of the resonance, the amplitude, is exactly uh, captured by the model. And then we see that the quasi-linear model that is uh, is uh, that is very often used to study such kind of system uh, fails to predict the evolution of the system. Uh, it just goes to the infinity. So this was the easiest example of our procedure. And now we will increase the number of the um, degrees of freedom. Now we have two pendulums which are coupled your, uh, uh, with the nonlinear coupling. So we have only uh, not only a nonlinear uh, on-site potential, but we have on, also a significantly nonlinear coupling uh, potential. And uh, using the same method, which we call the semi-inverse method, uh, this means that we first define the, uh, first uh, suppose some um, frequency of the resonance, and then only after uh, the asymptotic procedure is applied, define this frequency. Uh, using this procedure, we obtain the equation of motion which looks a bit more complicated that, than the one uh, in the quasi-linear case. Uh, uh, J1 uh, are the Bessel functions of the first kind. And using and uh, also we obtain uh, the new integral of motion, uh, which is the norm. Or uh, uh, in the quantum mechanics, it's defined very often as the um, uh, occupation number. And uh, this new integral of motion helps us to define the evolution of the system. Here are the details of the asymptotic procedure, uh, but I will not uh, go into details right now. And um, this allows us uh, first to, uh, to define the amplitudes of the nonlinear normal modes, uh, depending on the amplitude of the excitation. And we see that uh, the inversion of the modes appears when the amplitude grows. So uh, the when the amplitudes are uh, low, the in-phase mode uh, has lower frequency than the outer phase mode, which is a quite normal case. And if the amplitude of the excitation grows, then the, um, uh, the 
the frequency of the in-phase mode becomes higher than the frequency of the anti-phase mode. And here we see also the comparison with the numerical data, the exact numerical data obtained, uh, uh, obtained for initial system and the asymptotic uh, analytical um, values obtained in our analysis. As we see, the results are quite good up to oscillations uh, around uh, um, nine tenths of pi, which means that uh, this is, these are almost rotations. I will mention that we do not consider rotations in this research, but this kind of approach can be uh, proceed to the, to the rotations. However, in my talk, I will deal only with the oscillations in nonlinear system. Then uh, we can, using the new integral of motion, we can uh, introduce new variables. And this will be um, uh, amplitude, uh, uh, amplitude variable and phase variable. And this allows us to reduce the uh, number of degrees of uh, freedom and to consider the system on the phase plane. Here you see the results of the um, um, of the uh, analysis, I'm sorry, uh, these are concurrent maps, and here you see exactly the nonlinear normal modes, and the uh, you see that uh, the uh, evolution around the modes is absolutely possible, and uh, starting with the energy on one oscillator, we can proceed to the another one. I will show you exactly how it, it looks at the phase plane. So if uh, there is the phase plane, some letters are not shown, I'm sorry, uh, the horizontal axis shows the delta, the phase shift between the two oscillators, while the vertical um, axis shows theta, which is the relation between the excitations of the two oscillators. When theta is equal to zero, oh, I'm sorry, uh, when theta is equal to zero, all the energy is concentrated on one of the oscillators, or, or on one of the pendula. When theta is equal to pi divided by two, all the energy is concentrated on the another one. And here you see the limiting phase trajectory, the red dashed line, which shows the maximum energy change between the two oscillators, or the beatings. And you see that this, uh, this trajectory, um, can, uh, uh, can uh, be changed during the evolution of the phase uh, plane. If we increase the, if we decrease the coupling or increase the energy uh, in the system, uh, first of all, the bifurcation of the nonlinear normal mode appears. However, this does not affect the energy transfer between the two parts of the system. And only if the a limiting phase trajectory collides with the separatrix, which divides, divides two newborn stationary points, then the energy transfer between two, um, between two um, pendula is not possible anymore. And then non-stationary localization of the energy on one of the two pendula appears. And here we can find the localization threshold found um, analytically. And uh, we have compared it uh, with the uh, result of the contrast section uh, um, analysis. And here you see that when the, um, the coupling parameter is above the threshold, uh, the limiting phase trajectory, which is red dashed line here, uh, is, uh, uh, connects the uh, two um, energy states. And uh, on the concurrent map, uh, Below the threshold, we see the separation of the phase um, area, uh, which means that uh, energy is localized on one of the um, parts of the phase space. So uh, then we proceed to the system with the more degrees of freedom. There is a system of three oscillators. However, first I have to say that this system has a bit more problems than the system of the two oscillator. Uh, if you look at the standard multiple scale procedure, where we again separate the fast and slow dynamics, uh, we see that the uh, 
middle uh, oscillator is uh, not equivalent to the side oscillator because it has two um, connections with the neighbors and not one. And this means that this asymmetry will, uh, will cause some problems. And this uh, asymmetry uh, was studied, so the role of the nonlinearity of such asymmetry was studied in our uh, in, uh, um, in some works uh, made by me and my colleagues. And uh, we have found that if the nonlinearity is of the soft type, then uh, not only localization of the energy on one of the oscillators is uh, possible, but also intensive energy exchange between the two sides of the, of the uh, short chain. However, if we have the nonlinearity of the hard uh, type, then from the energy localization on one element, we proceed to the energy localization on the two elements, while the thought is almost not excited. And only if we increase the energy or um, the coupling, we see the intensive energy exchange, but which is not regular. So the regimes of the regular energy exchange between the two sides of the short chain is possible due to uh, nonlinearity. When the nonlinearity of the soft type compensates the inequality of the middle element and the side elements. Okay, and then we proceed. If we got three pendula, we got the nonlinearity of the soft type, which means that we can observe the an intensive energy exchange between one side of the short chain to another one. Here uh, we have also the uh, the significantly nonlinear coupling. And here we proceed again with the same inverse procedure, uh, separate slow and fast dynamics and obtain the uh, a bit more uh, complicated system of occasions. However, we got again the new integral of motion, which allows us to reduce a uh, number of degrees of freedom of the system. And then we proceed first to the- We have five more minutes. Uh, I see, thank you. So, and then uh, here we again compare the nonlinear normal modes of the system and again have good results. And here we show that the uh, localization threshold has nothing to do with the nonlinear normal mode stability. And this means that this should be something else. We reduce the system using the new integral of motion to the uh, to study the Poincare maps of the reduced order system. And we see the stationary regimes, which are strongly localized, uh, or with the intensive energy exchange between the two sides of the short chain. And uh, here we studied also the spectra of this localized and uh, non-localized regimes. And also the same, uh, the same procedure uh, allowed us to study the sine lattice, which is the model of many um, macromolecules, ferromagnetic systems, spin system, which is the model of the same type. And the same procedure, I will not go into detail, allows us to predict the evolution of the spectra uh, with the increase of the energy of the excitation. Uh, here we also uh, see the inversion of spectra and uh, can predict uh, how the uh, the um, uh, wave numbers uh, uh, wave numbers change with the increase of the excitation level and uh, then introducing the combination of the two um, nonlinear normal modes we can introduce the asymmetry. Uh, initial conditions when all the energy is concentrated on one of the parts of the chain. Uh, and uh, for example, on one half of the chain, uh, there are the profiles of these uh, effective particles or coherence domains, how we, um, how we name the parts of the chain which can be um, excited using the combination of the two neighboring um, nonlinear normal modes. 
and uh, using the same asymptotic procedure, we, pr we uh, proceed to the very similar uh, phase planes, which can uh, which give us the evolution of the limiting phase trajectory, and we obtain the analytical condition for the localization of the energy on one of the uh, on one of the uh, parts of the nonlinear chain. And here we see that uh, this condition is uh, quite good verified by the numerical analysis, uh, which means that the Intensive energy exchange between the two parts of the nonlinear chain uh, can be predicted analytically using the semi inverse procedure and uh, using the um, um, and using the long long wave limits. We can also study the breather solutions in such a system and predict its form uh, quite good uh, using this approach. I will not go into details in the further analysis due to shortage of time. However, I will mention that uh, using the same, uh, the same approach, we can uh, look at the uh, excitation and energy transfer uh, in the systems of paraffins, uh, in the macromolecules, and uh, also in some other systems where the significant nonlinearity is uh, playing its crucial role. And this is, uh, I guess, I will proceed to the, to the conclusions. This I skip. Uh, and oh, here are my uh, conclusions. So uh, we have shown that the regular energy transport and its localization in the strongly nonlinear systems can be studied analytically. And the semi inverse procedure allows to uh, give opportunity to construct the asymptotic model for energy transport process. The limiting phase trajectory helps to analyze the energy transport and the localization threshold. And the approach can be used for different nonlinear systems with many degrees of freedom. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation of very nice analytical results. Because I cannot see the audience, I would like to ask Anton Krivtsov, Professor Krivtsov, to ask questions from the audience. Probably now you can see at least me. I see Alexei Sokolov. Ah, now I see you. Yes. Are there questions from the audience? Okay. <laughs> yes, colleagues, any questions? Maybe I will start. So thank you. Thank you very much for a uh, very interesting lecture indeed. And um, uh, my question is, um, uh, so uh, uh, it looks like uh, really very um, good um, tools. We have good tools to, to study energy transfer in uh, different nonlinear system, even complex system. The um, question, uh, if we try to um, consider uh, long chains, uh, and uh, we can also speak about the problems if the energy transfer is similar to what we expect from mic microscopic when we have something like uh, Fourier behavior, or this can, could be kind of anomalous heat transfer. Uh, is this um, uh, approach possible? Um, can it help in uh, uh, answering this kind of uh, uh, actually, this approach is uh, valid for the system with the uh, limited degrees of freedom, of course, because uh, if we take infinite, uh, uh, infinite amount of degrees of freedom, then all the thresholds of the localization thresholds uh, are Meet together, and then we cannot separate them analytically. And they, they are quite good approaches, which are long, um, long uh, wave approximations. However, our, if we deal with the system with many degrees of freedom, then we can use this approach. The um, the problem is that uh, when you uh, when you are having the heat transfer, when you are going with the heat bus or when we are dealing with it, then uh, there will be enough 
uh, another approach. However, this approach can be used when you got very good separated uh, levels of energy, which means that even the three level, four level system, quantum mechanics can be studied with a similar um, situation. Uh, we have used this approach to study the energy transfer uh, in the system of the nanotubes in the array. We have studied, uh, we have used this approach to study the granular crystals in the condition of the sonic vessel. And this approach works perfectly. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think this thank you for the answer. answer. I think we have to move on. There was one question from the online audience, Mr. Matthew Card. I cannot read his last name. Can you make it a very short question, please, and a very short answer? Okay, thank you very much. Very good presentation. It was very interesting. Can you tell me if the coupling between the cubic oscillators is always the same parameter value? So if alpha or beta are always the same, please. Um, so uh, we were, uh, what kind of coupling do you use? Uh, this, the, the type of coupling is significantly important because when you use the linear coupling then you uh, expect one behavior and when you use the nonlinear coupling even for the uh, one for, for the same uh, value of the parameter but for the different uh, excitation levels then we will get quite different response so one of the controlling parameter is the energy uh, introduced into the system or the amplitude of the uh, evolution cause if the system is significantly nonlinear and the coupling is nonlinear, then the response so the the character of the in, um, interaction will be quite different. Okay, thank you. I realize we're short of time, so thank, thank you, you very much. much for your understanding. Yes, indeed, we need to move on to our next presentation which will be given by Alexei Sokolov. Alexei Sokolov is a student at both universities, here at the Technical University in Berlin, Germany, and also at the Peter the Great University, Polytechnic University in St. Petersburg. His supervisor in St. Petersburg is Professor Kriftsov, and I'm trying to supervise him over here. He's going to present some results on his on our joint research from our research grant. And the title of his presentation is Deterministic and Stochastic Processes in a One-Dimensional Quasi-Continuum. Please start. Yeah, so uh, while the presentation is loading, um, I can say a couple of words. Um, so yes, uh, this is the work which we do together within the joint grants uh, um, of DFG and uh, uh, Russian Science Foundation with uh, Professor Muller and Professor Borobov um, and Professor um, This work is dedicated to um, wave propagation in the discrete systems and uh, stochastic processes associated with this. Uh, wave propagation, and as we could see from uh, today's morning plenary session, that um, um, waves play a significant role in various interesting processes, such as anomalous heat conduction. Yes, and um, on the other hand, uh, some other frameworks are developed, which uh, um, allow us to describe such phenomena from, uh, for example, from um, kinetic theory. But in this work, we are going to investigate how the waves propagate in the discrete systems. I hope the presentation will finally work. Okay, so uh, the outline of my talk, I will speak a little bit about the history of the system I investigate. This is a simple harmonic um, harmonic chain, uh, which uh, um, uh, 
like um, a term which was introduced by Professor Kripsov as uh, a Hookian chain. Um, then I will speak about the dynamic, uh, the equations which uh, describe the motion in the system. Then I will say, uh, move on to the concept of quasi continuum, which allows to describe processes in this discrete system within the framework of uh, continuum equations, which uh, may be very helpful from a mathematical point of view. But then we will uh, take a look at the deterministic processes, um, then um, to the stochastic processes, uh, which are connected with uh, energy and temperature transfer. Um, and uh, then we will uh, come to a ballistic heat equation, uh, which is a consequence of uh, aforementioned uh, topics. Okay, so the first, um, uh, one of the first works considering the system was made by Hamilton in uh, 1839, uh, where he derived uh, first the uh, uh, actually relation which described motion in such system. Uh, but uh, these relations are expressed in rather cumbersome um, mathematical formulas, which were uh, so far not so good developed. For example, the Bessel function was uh, introduced uh, around this time, so Hamilton did not express it in terms of Bessel function. Uh, then Schrodinger uh, uh, in 1914, he uh, um, introduced a very elegant solution of, um, uh, of this problem. Uh, and uh, proposed a solution uh, uh, using uh, Bessel functions. Uh, these works are dedicated to deterministic processes. Um, then later, uh, Klein uh, and um, Nobel laureate Ilya Prigozhin considered uh, stochastic problems in the system and derived equations which describe equilibration of energies and um, energy transport um, in such system, which later recently were um, um, also discovered using uh, covariance analysis and called slow and fast motions. Then a little bit later, Hannah did, um, I think in parallel, uh, similar, uh, he obtained similar results, uh, but as well, he considered several very, very illustrative problems. Uh, actually, his uh, goal was to obtain Fourier law from a uh, linear harmonic chain, and he uh, failed in both the case. Um, the next topic, which uh, I will um, uh, consider is uh, quasi continuum um, and uh, the main works for, uh, actually this concept was introduced by Isaac Kunian, and uh, a very good overview is uh, uh, presented in the book of uh, Leonid Slitan um, in the beginning. So this is uh, a very good overview. So let us move on to the system. This is a simple um, chain with uh, equal masses, which are connected with equal stiffnesses C. And the uh, it, its motion is governed by equation of motion, um, very well known with uh, some arbitrary initial condition. Then uh, the solution may be obtained uh, um, in several ways. So Schrodinger proposed a very elegant solution by change of coordinates, and then uh, an ingenious. Uh, um, Substitution uh, of cylindrical function it may be obtained differently, so we can find we can consider a finite system of n particles, then find its solution uh, as a superposition of um, um, normal modes, and then uh, we find the thermodynamic limit and um, obtain uh, the solution which coincides with what was proposed. By Schrodinger, what is interesting in uh, this equation is that if we have, for example, only displacements, 
then uh, our displacement field is obtained uh, as a superposition of Bessel functions of even order. But if we um, consider velocity field with some arbitrary initial velocities at zero displacement, then we take a derivative and then we see that it will be uh, indeed also this uh, in similar way described uh, as a superposition with Bessel functions of even order. So uh, it, there is no difference either we uh, consider the problem of displacements with some initial displacements or, or velocities with some initial velocities. Then um, let us uh, take a look at the uh, concept of quasi continuum. So, uh, concept of quasi continuum uh, is uh, the idea to build a one to one correspondence between the functions which are uh, defined on the um, uh, integer node, uh, in, in, integer position of particles, and some continuum function. And um, uh, in the book of uh, Isaac Union, it was found that this uh, one to one correspondence uh, is governed by uh, such equation. And uh, one can um, uh, see this transformation as follows. So if we take a look at the obtained uh, um, function at the Fourier transform of the obtained function, it will be um, some Fourier image which is bounded. Um, uh, which is bounded uh, at uh, local S region. So uh, we can build uh, this function as follows. So we can, for example, um, um, draw any line uh, which coincides uh, with our discrete function at uh, the position of particles, then find its Fourier image, and then just cut out the uh, Higher oscillations, which are mm, unphysical for such systems. So, uh, if we uh, then uh, take the uh, so, uh, aforementioned solution for this discrete system, uh, which describes the motion of this system, we can build uh, the corresponding for the continuum representation, and then uh, using this formula. Um, it is seen that it set, satisfies the uh, uh, differential uh, delay equation, so or it is called differential shift equation. Um, what is interesting here is because uh, when, uh, for example, the wave motion uh, uh, wave equation is derived from harmonic crystal, such equation is also written, but uh, this x is defined only in the position of particles. Here, uh, this equation is valid for all the values of uh, continuum coordinate x. And um, from this solution, also it uh, satisfies uh, our usual uh, initial conditions for displacements and velocity. So let us take a look at uh, uh, the processes which uh, are described by this equation. So here you see uh, a numerical solution of the uh, above mentioned equation. And it's um, interesting that uh, in the discretization scheme, the um, uh, mesh, uh, the step of mesh is finer than um, interatomic um, distance. So uh, the step of mesh is uh, smaller than this parameter A. Uh, this leads to this interesting behavior. So we see that at small times, uh, this process coincides with uh, a classical wave equation, which is um, um, presented uh, in the red line. And then some interesting phenomena occurs. And in particular, we see that this uh, initial profile starts to break down. Uh, then it starts to dissociate, to smear in uh, space. And also it uh, starts to lag from uh, uh, usual position uh, of T where C is the speed of sound. Um, then um, uh, we can investigate uh, this profile using method of uh, stationary phase. Um, so the usual expression, which is obtained by method of stationary phase, is rather um, scary and um, helpless. So we can find asymptotics near the wavefront. And um, 
to find some interesting asymptotics, uh, uh, in particular that the front decays. Uh, so in, in this conservative system, actually the front of initial impulse start to decay as um, this power law, then uh, these um, front will lack according also to power law in time and its velocity will also change um, according to this asymptote. So uh, conclusions for this part is that uh, we obtained uh, a continuum equation describing wave propagation in uh, harmonic crystal. Actually, it was derived earlier in the book of Kunin and Slikan, uh, but in more general form. And uh, this particular case was for some reason not uh, presented probably because uh, it was considered too uh, simple. Um, then we consider the asymptotics of the wave front and so we develop a numerical scheme for this situation. Then we move on to stochastic processes. Seven uh, minutes left, including discussion. Yes, thank you. Um, we use Hamiltonian stochastic dynamics. That means that we use the uh, same solution with uh, stochastic initial conditions. Um, and we uh, uh, come to the following equation for um, average uh, kinetic energies. Uh, and uh, we have two types of processes uh, where we have um, uh, initial local equilibration where initially kinetic and potential energies are equal and uh, where we have only uh, kinetic energies excited. Um, so uh, for a uh, homogeneous um, for homogeneous fields, at least to the fo uh, following results. So for non-equilibrated fields, we will have some uh, uh, we'll have the process of equilibration, which uh, uh, was called uh, in uh, earlier words as a fast process. Uh, and for quasi-equilibrated uh, fields, uh, it will remain the same. So for a non-homogeneous uh, field also, um, uh, we can uh, obtain uh, similar equations for, uh, for non-equilibrated fields and, uh, and equilibrated fields. And uh, I would propose that we uh, take a look at some pictures. So we see that if only the kinetic uh, degrees of freedom are excited, we have the process of um, uh, energy transfer and the process of equilibration. And in the case of uh, uh, initially equilibrated system, uh, we have only the process of uh, energy transfer. Then um, uh, we use the definition of kinetic temperature. Uh, and for this kinetic temperature, from uh, the equations for uh, kinetic energy dynamics, we obtain the equation of kinetic temperature dynamics. And using this, uh, discrete representation, we, um, by using uh, correspondence with quasi-continuum, we uh, obtain the equation of quasi-continuum, uh, so quasi-continuum ballistic heat equation, which describes, um, uh, which describes a propagation of uh, a kinetic temperature uh, without any um, uh, uh, continualization. And by uh, doing continualization, we arrived at earlier Iraq ballistic heat equation. So um, um, in this section, we uh, derived ballistic heat equation on the basis of fundamental solution of this quick problem, uh, derived uh, a non-local quasi-continuum ballistic equation, uh, which uh, do not use any long wave approximation. Um, and uh, these equations are derived from uh, uh, initially quasi-equilibrated system, which differs from uh, the previous approach where uh, it was derived from a um, uh, uh, system where only kinetic energies were excited. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. We have three minutes for discussions. Other questions from St. Petersburg? Uh, and uh, my question is, I say, and what you um, you have this uh, uh, continuum equation, 
uh, and uh, uh, which is um, generalization of the discrete equation of the triangle. And the question is uh, how you will um, um, how will you set the initial conditions between the nodes? No, uh, so the procedure is the following. You set the initial conditions for this grid system, and then you uh, build uh, using one-to-one -one correspondence between this grid system and quasi-continuum. You uh, build quasi-continuum. Uh, so you mean even for initial conditions, you can have this one-to-one uh, -one correspondence? Yes, of course. For, for any discrete function and your initial condition. So this is indeed a very big question because first I wanted to build this was a continuum fields and did not know how to, to what to do between the nodes. And then I just thought that I have the initial conditions, uh, the stochastic initial, because the problem is to do the stochastic initial conditions between the nodes because it should be uh, a continuum. Okay, maybe, so, uh, maybe any questions from uh, we, we have a question here from the online people. There's one question by Alexander Morozov. <laughs> Yeah, hello. Uh, oh, you can hear me. That's great. I, I have a question regarding your um, uh, non-equilibrated and quasi-equilibrated boundary conditions. And uh, that was done for the wave equation. Could you please comment on uh, what uh, should it be and how to physically interpret them in terms of temperature? Um, actually, uh, it was done not for the wave equation, but for uh, for uh, dynamics of uh, kinetic energy. So, uh, so here uh, um, in the equation of dynamics of kinetic energy, you can have uh, initially uh, some velocities and some deformations. And uh, so if you have only velocities and zero deformations, then you have a non-equilibrated system because then uh, when you start the process, the energy will uh, flow from kinetic to potential degrees of freedom. But you can initially uh, set them equalized so they do not need to, um, to equalize because they will be equalized. Oh, okay, and a uh, second question. Maybe I have asked you already on some previous conferences, but I have forgotten. Uh, on, on your ballistic equation, of, of course, there is a term where you have a T dot over T, and this is some uh, um, nice limit. Is, uh, is there any limitation on your initial conditions then? Yes, um, uh, yes, it's a good question because uh, uh, this equation will work uh, Actually, it arises only with initial conditions when you have a zero, um, uh, zero T dots at the beginning. Okay, thanks. So uh, then this, this term vanishes. Also, it, it, it can be seen from an integral representation of uh, solution of this equation, but uh, I did not mention it. Thank you very much again for your presentation. We will now move on to our next speaker. I would like to announce Sergei Ryaskov. The title of his presentation is Discrete and Continuum Approaches to Description of Heat Transport in a Semi-Infinite Free End Books Chain. He comes from the Russian Federation from St. Petersburg. Yeah, colleagues, I'm introducing my master project, which is devoted to a discrete and continuum approach to description of heat transport in a semi infinity and book chain. Почему кликер не будет? Там надо выключить. Окей, according to the modern experimental observations, uh, heat transport of micro and nanoscale propagates ballistically, about which 
the dependence of thermal conductivity on material size uh, says. Therefore, we need uh, a full-fledged uh, analytical theory uh, predicting ballistic uh, heat uh, propagation. Moreover, in order to, uh, with accuracy model experiment, um, we need to take into account uh, uh, boundary effects of material. Following this uh, purpose, I solve uh, two simplest problems. The first is heat transport in a semi-infinite uh, Hook chain caused by instantaneous uh, heat pulse, and the second heat transport in a semi infinite chain uh, caused by external heat supply. There, um, as was uh, earlier said, several approach. Two of this uh, are using uh, the kinetic Boltzmann equation uh, without uh, a collision integral, and the second approach is uh, OT dynamics. I solve. Uh, my problems in the frameworks of the water dynamics. Let us consider the hook chain, hook chain with uh, an identity particles uh, with, uh, two, uh, with uh, two free ends. Number of particles is uh, constant in time. There are assumptions. Uh, particle interact only with the nearest neighbors and uh, Initial, there is an uh, initial temperature profile in, in the chain, which can be generated uh, via ultra short uh, laser pulse and zero heat flux. To so my assumptions, uh, the following dynamics equations with uh, initial conditions uh, correspond. Dynamics equation and uh, initial conditions with uh, zero displacements uh, and uh, random uh, initial velocities. This, uh, this dynamic equations uh, are analyzed uh, by Hema, by Takizawa with Kabayashi, and uh, the solution of uh, Bessel uh, function series uh, is uh, obtained, but uh, the solution is uh, cumbersome for analysis of uh, stochastic problems. Therefore, uh, I use uh, the eigenfunction decomposition method. The, form, the exact formula for particle velocities uh, is uh, obtained. And if we substitute to statistical definition of the kinetic temperature, we obtain uh, the formula for the discrete kinetic temperature. Let us uh, suppose that the right of chain is located far away from the domain. Uh, allows uh, to proceed into the thermodynamic limit and uh, consider the chain uh, as the semi-infinite chain. There is an uh, exact formula for the discrete kinetic temperature in the thermodynamic limit. Yes, we have obtained the exact formula for the discrete kinetic temperature, but uh, if we want uh, to use uh, this uh, as a constitutive relation, we must uh, obtain uh, expression as a function of a special coordinate. Uh, therefore, we proceed to continualization. Continualization is based on the following approach. The first is dividing into the fast and slow motions. The second is uh, continualization. We introduce uh, some measure scale, which is much more than a distance between particles, microscale, and uh, much less than a microscale, the length of the chain. We divide the chain into equal intervals and suppose that in the frameworks uh, of uh, measure scale, the initial kinetic temperature changes slowly. It allows to consider the kinetic temperature in the frameworks uh, of the measure scale as a constant function. Finally, we introduce a continuum kinetic, initial kinetic temperature the function which coincides uh, in the points of a particle location so with the discrete values. We have uh, obtained uh, the continuum kinetic temperature composed of uh, two terms. The first term corresponds to the equilibration of kinetic and potential energies, uh, fast motion. And the second term corresponds to the ballistic heat transport. The continuum solution is uh, present as a superposition of uh, wave packets propagating with uh, group velocities. 
Let us consider point heat uh, perturbation. We consider continuum solution. Uh, since uh, fast uh, motions uh, are instant, we can neglect uh, the fast term and consider only the slow term. Let us investigate the behavior of the thermal waves. If we hit, an, if we hit uh, at some point, thermal waves at, uh, in both waves, one wave reflects from thermal waves uh, backwards. If we consider the infinite chain with similar sources, the solution for continuum solution for the kinetic temperature will be the same. Let us formulate a principle of symmetry of continuum solution. Continuum solution for the kinetic temperature uh, for the semi-infinite chain uh, with the free end and some source coincides with continuum solution for the infinite chain with the same and the mirror sources. Let us consider rectangular heat pulse uh, out of the boundary. Let us uh, see uh, again after initially a continuum and discrete solution uh, coincide. But after achieving the end by thermal width, there is a jump. The discrete uh, kinetic temperature undergoes a jump. Near the boundary. There is a jump uh, continuum and distributions. There is a jump after reflection of uh, the whole wave front. And uh, propagation of wave front uh, is well described by continuum solution because uh, the continuum solution is uh, a middle one of the discrete uh, kinetic temperature. This is the uh, evolution of the temperature on the boundary, which uh, in which continuum and discrete solution have uh, some different asymptotic behavior. There are results and my uh, preparing uh, preprint. Let us consider the second problem, heat transport caused by external heat supply. The this is the uh, dynamics equation. Uh, there are uh, one driven equation. Object of study is uh, the same, but the chain uh, is uh, surrounded by a weakly viscous environment. And there are zero initial conditions. But the dynamics equations uh, have a right path uh, which uh, corresponds to the uncorrelated linear processes. The discrete kinetic temperature is uh, obtained as follows. We seek uh, the discrete kinetic temperature in this form and uh, seek the covariance uh, matrix uh, based on the Exact, exact solution for the image of uh, displacements uh, and velocity for particles uh, through the Ito lemma. And uh, if we know the covariance matrix, uh, we will know the exact solution for the discrete kinetic temperature. There is, uh, there is a formula for the discrete uh, kinetic temperature, which uh, it's present as a convolution of the velocity of heating and the uh, form function. But uh, this uh, expression is uh, cumbersome for continuization. Therefore, the principle of symmetry of continuum solution uh, helps us. The continuum, the kinetic temperature in the continuum limit uh, is uh, represented as a convolution of the continuum function of the heating velocity and uh, fundamental solution obtained by Gavrilov. Let us consider sudden point heat supply without dissipation. Five fields uh, uh, 
of continuum in this solution uh, concept, but uh, after reflection, continuum solution uh, describes uh, evolution of kinetic temperature with L. There are significantly different uh, symptomatic behavior of the temperatures on the boundary. At large times, uh, the continuum solution will be much more than the discrete solution. Let us uh, take an account uh, dissipation. In case of dissipation, uh, continuum and discrete solution of uh, fast fields of the kinetic temperature uh, coincide, but uh, continuum solution with uh, error describes the field near the boundary. And uh, on the left part, uh, uh, there is a plot of evolution of the temperature on the boundary, at the boundary and uh, heating point. And uh, there was an unexpected result. The stationary value of uh, the temperature on the boundary strongly depends on the point of location of source. There is a go to a point uh, in which a continuum and discrete uh, solution will be considered. Okay, there are results. As a future work, uh, the following problem uh, uh, can be proposed. This is a clarification of a continuum solution by stitching of the far field continuum solution with the discrete kinetic temperature near the boundary. And clarificated uh, continuum solution uh, can be further used, used uh, as a uh, constitutive relation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. We have some time for questions. Seven minutes are left. So please, questions from the audience in St. Petersburg. And we also have a question here from the online people. Let's start with St. Petersburg. Yes, please, uh, Sergey. thank you very much for a very interesting uh, report. Uh, there was um, an animation where you have this um, oscillations uh, and where you compare uh, an elliptical solution with uh, yeah. uh, 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 yeah. um, another second one. Okay. Yes. Here, so you see that from the uh, left uh, uh, point, uh, there is some perturbation uh, travels. Uh, further to the right, yes, some kind of uh, a soliton or uh, a, a kink uh, or a peak, yes, uh, I would call it. So did you try to isolate it from the, uh, from the uh, function and to investigate what, 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 what's this, what, what's the animal? Um, uh, did you mean that? Uh, this one, yeah. Uh, the oscillations? Yeah, uh, like here, here, yeah, yeah, this one. So because it looks like a um, fundamental solution for a uh, discrete problem. Yes, it's similar. So, uh, it, it, but uh, I have uh, considered uh, uh, the both uh, fast and slow forces, and uh, there is uh, an effect of uh, fast forces. So, but did, you did not try to isolate it on this. No, maybe uh, maybe for the work. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if it's possible, uh, important to note for the discrete kinetic temperature can be um, separated. Uh, this uh, is a uh, question. It, it looks like on the left, uh, as uh, it was like external heat uh, of one particle. Okay. No. Thank you. This uh, is continuous. It's the point. Okay. Yes. Uh, what is the nature of these oscillations? Uh, left, left side. Oscillations? Yeah. There is a fast process. Fast process described by a basic function. No. Located function is not good. Uh, um, located um, located uh, uh, 
uh, in the domain uh, of uh, infancy calls. So any questions from the... Yes, we have a question from Matthew Cartmill now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. A very interesting presentation. I have one short question. Um, I think it was slide 24. You mentioned the term thermodynamic um, limit. Um, yeah, here. I, I assume that means something to do with the discretization that you used and how fine it was and how many particles you looked at. Um, how, how far did you go with that, you know, towards that limit? Uh, uh, can you repeat uh, the thermodynamic limit uh, is the limit uh, when the number of uh, particles tend to infinity? Is this an answer? Have I, have I answer? Sorry, okay, okay. Uh, let's leave it there. Obviously, time is short. Thank you. Oh, we, we still have three minutes, so if... Okay, if you're, if, you're, if you're able to let me speak a bit longer. Uh, I was interested in what happens when you start to approach this uh, difficult point. You know, um, your analysis is obviously taking the system when it's pretty well below that. Obviously, um, what happens as you approach that? Is, is this something you've looked at or did you not need to look at that? Maybe it can... Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe uh, I should consider that uh, later. This uh, expression starts in the thermodynamic limit and uh, at all the expressions uh, which uh, are early obtained uh, uh, and uh, we end with uh, two <coughs> in the chain with uh, two p ends, but uh, I didn't write in the presentation. Okay, okay. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much again for your presentation. And um, without further ado, I would like to get to the next speaker. Um, this will be Raisa Rubinova, and her title is Heat Transfer in Infinite One Dimensional Crystal, considering the nth coordination sphere. She is also from the Russian Federation from St. Petersburg and from Peter the Great. St. Petersburg Polytechnic University. So please, the podium is yours. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Raisa Rubinova, and as mentioned, I'm going to give a short stage on my master project, which is heat transfer in infinite one dimensional crystal considering the end coordination sphere. So, in my uh, research, several models were considered, and they are based on one point common approach where we assume that the interactions are quasi elastic, so we can. Um, the big down crystal as a chain that is of particles that are connected by linear strings. And uh, there were done the, some research recently, uh, not only considering the nearest interactions, but also the second coordination sphere. And uh, the aim of my uh, research was to continue this investigation. Therefore, there were two models considered. The first one is crystal considering the third coordination sphere, the one depicted on the slide, where the interactions with basically six nearest neighbors are considered. And there were three arrivals. 
discrete synthesis for each coordination here. And the second model was the model considering the offer the neighbor with which we consider the interaction. And we will write the number of interactions considered from the first continuation here to basically the infinity. And our goal was to describe how the heat rate propagation will be affected by the introduction of these additional uh, interactions. Let me start with the first model, crystal considering the first continuation C. And the first step for us was to derive the dispersion relation so that we can um, describe the frequencies of the waves that can propagate in the system of given configuration. And as it can be seen, this expression will not only be the function of the wave number, but also three additional parameters, three thicknesses. And in order to reduce the problem and its complexity, the parameterization was done and the new expression was obtained. And the parameterization was done in such a way that now we consider only two uh, coefficients that correspond to the relative uh, stiffnesses of the interaction. And we have parameter beta, which describes the shift from the first coordination speed to the second, and parameter gamma, which defines uh, forces uh, of interaction with the third coordination sphere. So here on this slide, you can see some plots for this dispersion relation, and you can see that under fixed beta, the increase in gamma will uh, result in the emerge of the third extremum. And the variation of beta won't affect uh, the behavior of the system so drastically in this case, but it will change, of course, the values and also the position of uh, our local maximum. After that, the group velocities were obtained and they allow us to uh, find how many waves will propagate in the crystal and what will be the velocities of this drone. And once again, you can see that in this case, three uh, extrema might be observed. So there might be up to three waves in this case. It might be interesting to look at the function uh, and how the maximum group velocity, so the velocity of the fastest wave will depend on our um, coefficients. And here we see uh, the possible configurations of the system, the possible modified thicknesses. And we can see that uh, the highest values of the velocities will be obtained when the uh, interactions with the third coordination sphere are the strongest one. And also we obtain here a local maximum, uh, which is a very interesting operation. <laughs> so then the fundamental solution was constructed and heat propagation was studied uh, with the help of the formulas derived by Professor Kipsov and Puskin and only slow processes were considered in this case. So the temperature distribution uh, in this case could be found using this expression. And once again, there will be from one to three waves propagating in this case, and also the intensity coefficient of the vicinity of the heat front was obtained uh, to see how it will vary from the parameters. And here there are plots that show us uh, how the number and uh, the velocity and intensity of the waves will depend on the waves will propagate uh, because of the interactions with the third coordination sphere are not strong enough to pass the third wave, but then the third wave will emerge and its velocity will be very, very close to the velocity of the second wave and its intensity will also be very similar, which is shown here. And also, we have built the same plots, we constructed them for several values of parameter beta, and according to the way how it was defined, it can be also negative, which corresponds to some uh, negative stiffnesses of the connection with the second coordination sphere. In this case, uh, there are still options when the system is stable. And here we can say that opposing to the previous case where uh, all waves, they were like one wave which was always faster than the other. Here it's uh, slightly different, but we still see the region where only two waves propagate and the third wave then later emerge. And the interesting case is also the limiting case where gamma is equal to uh, half of the pi. And in this case, all the three velocities will coincide and there will be only one heat front. 
Also, the numerical solution for the initial perturbation in form of the rectangular input of finite length and height was considered. And in this case, once again, we obtained from one to three waves. So the results are the same. The second model was the model where the way how the particles interact with each other was fixed, but we changed the number of interactions considered. And in this case, the dispersion relation is a monotonous uh, increasing function. And we see that with the increase of the number of coordination spheres considered, the frequencies will also increase. And we can uh, find the maximum possible frequency as a function of our parameter that we introduced, the number of coordination spheres. And we see that the series has a limit and the rate of convergence is pretty fast, as it can be seen from this plot. Uh, the group velocity in this case is the uh, monotonous decreasing function, which means that there will only be one extremum and only one hitch term propagating in this case. And once again, we can define the maximum velocity as a function of this parameter, the number of interactions we consider and it uh, uh, increases and also has a limit. Now the fundamental solution was obtained and there are some peculiarities observed in this case. So first of all, even though we have one heat front, it does not mean that we have only one wave. Actually, we have uh, the same number of waves as the number of coordinations we considered, but they propagate with the same velocity. And also we see that the temperature distribution in this case has a form of perturbations around some certain equilibrium temperature with the decreasing amplitude. And to obtain this uh, equilibrium temperature, the limiting case was considered, where the number of uh, interactions tend to infinite. And in this case, the group velocity will be a linear monotonous descending function, and uh, the fundamental solution will have a very simple form of a rectangular shape. And also, just as before, we can find the intensity coefficient in the vicinity of the heat front, and will descend as it can be seen from the figure. And also important remark here is that due to the way how the second derivative of the group velocity is defined, uh, the interval where this approximation is valid will also decrease with the increase of the number of interactions considered. Finally, the numerical solution for another initial perturbation was obtained here. And what we can see, which is very nice, that when we uh, start um, introducing more non-nearest interactions, we start getting the linear gradient here, which means that we are approaching the diffusive heat propagation. So let me summarize what I have just told. In the crystal considering the third coordination sphere, we can uh, obtain from one to three uh, heat waves. And the, in general, their velocity will increase with the increase of the relative force of interactions with the third coordination sphere. And in the case of the crystal with the various number of coordination spheres considered, the number of the heat waves will correspond to the number of interactions taken into the account. And the, there is the convergence of the behavior of the system when we uh, uh, approach the limiting case. So that concludes that my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Um, I have already one question here from the online audience. Sergei Gavrilo put, Gavrilov put his hand up. Please go ahead. Uh, I have uh, the following question. Uh, could you show again me the, the dispersion curves uh, for the case of n uh, equals to three? Oh, yes, sure. Uh, dispersion relation. Okay. Uh, am I right that uh, uh, all dispersion curves, that this, this, all dispersion curves always uh, cross the origin uh, of uh, uh, coordinate system here? Can you please repeat the question? 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 Can you please repeat the
like each curve. Each but uh, in case of the uh, parabolic also half of the pi, we also have another route uh, where this torsion curve will be zero. And in other cases, there only will be one uh, zero value. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have questions in St. Petersburg? Yes. You please show the fundamental solution to the case of the uh, number of interactions. If you could speak up a little, it's impossible to hear. Ah. ah, okay. So uh, my question was, if uh, this, the width of this square is constant, or, and how, uh, how is it determined? Uh, so the point is to this equation, so it will propagate in time with the constant velocity, which corresponds to the maximum velocity. And uh, its height is defined by this position. Um, I just wanted to check the total area is constant. Further questions? If there are no further questions, let us thank our speaker once more. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. And uh, we come to our next speaker. Uh, this is Alexei Mazniak. And the title of his presentation is Studying Nanoscale Thermal Transport and Acoustic Waves with Extreme Ultraviolet Transient Gratings. It says he is from MIT, so that should be the US. There he is. Thank you very much for showing that. The podium is yours, please. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. You see my screen? Yes, and we hear you. Excellent. So for a change, I'm going to talk about experiments. And um, uh, since uh, from the previous talks, um, I have a sense that many of you work on theory. Um, I will do uh, a little, uh, spend a little more time on the introduction. Okay, so how do we measure uh, thermal transport on the nanoscale? Well, generally we can either um, do a steady state measurements or a transient measurements. So here is an example of a steady state measurement. Uh, people fabricate a tiny device and then uh, the sample is fabricated, nanostructures fabricated together with this device. Uh, and then the measurement is done just um, as on the macro scale, people measure the heat flux and the, the temperature difference and get the conductance. So it's, um, uh, people do very impressive things with that. Uh, however, there are challenges. And one challenge is that you just get a number, the conductance. And oftentimes uh, the conclusions are drawn from the uh, absolute accuracy of this, uh, of this number. Uh, and the measurements of um, thermal conductivity are notoriously bad uh, as far as the absolute accuracy is concerned, even on the macro scale. On top of that, um, if uh, the sample is fabricated together with the device, then you cannot reproduce this measurement in another lab, not even in a cell lab. You can do this experiment again and fabricate another device, but that will be another sample. Uh, and as a, as a result, there are many reports of um, questionable reliability. And uh, since uh, there were, uh, you know, talks here on, on about the ballistic transport, I just uh, 
I'll show one example, which is uh, total, total nonsense. So this is, uh, you know, what is claimed as ballistic uh, uh, heat transport uh, at room temperature in uh, um, nanowires as long as uh, eight microns. Okay. And now transient measurements uh, have an advantage that you don't just get a number, you get a time depends. And there is uh, infinitely more information on the time depends. And as an example, I just want to show you uh, an old classic experiment um, uh, with heat pulses um, uh, in a, a sodium fluoride uh, um, cell crystal at uh, very, low, um, very low temperatures. So here you have an impulsive heater, a sensor, and uh, what you see at, uh, at um, low temperatures, you see ballistic transport. So you see the arrival of uh, longitudinal phonons, uh, of transverse phonons, then you increase the temperature and you see the onset of the so-called second sound. And if you increase the temperature even more, you will see uh, eventually the, the transition to the diffusive regime. Um, so you see there is infinitely more information compared to uh, a steady state measurement where you just get a number. Uh, and, and there are phenomena, for example, second sound, there are phenomena that you can only see in a transient experiment. So now, however, uh, this is not scalable to the nanoscale. Uh, one reason it's not scalable is uh, the time scale. So you see here the measurements is um, uh, on the microsecond scale and the sample size was about a centimeter. So if you scale the sample down uh, to let's say 100 nanometers, and then instead of microseconds, they'll have tens of picoseconds. So you can't, uh, you can't do this uh, with uh, electronic circuits. However, we can do it with lasers. Uh, so you see the, with lasers, we can have very short pulses. Uh, a standard laser will give you 100 times a second pulse. So it's, uh, the time resolution is not a problem. Um, so now you still need, uh, uh, an, uh, somehow need to impose a nanoscale. And what uh, people often do, uh, they uh, make um, uh, nanoscale heaters, uh, place some metal structures on top of your sample. And they set the scale, so to speak. Uh, this is, of course, not the scale of the heat transport, uh, because uh, the, the heat transport goes from this nanoheaters to infinity. But it, it actually it, it shapes, you know, shapes the temperature field. So yes, the nanoscale is imposed. But there is another problem, and that problem is that if you are interested uh, in the heat transport and in, in this material and the sample. Uh, so then the metal heaters are not very helpful because there is a thermal boundary resistance between the metal heater and the sample. And the thermal boundary resistance is a very hard problem uh, in its own right in, in the thermal transport. And oftentimes it's dominant. Uh, so you want to find, some, find out something about what's going on with your sample, but the measurement will be dominant by this um, uh, thermal boundary resistance, uh, which uh, plays uh, an especially large role uh, when you when you scale things down to, 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 to nanometers. So many complications. Uh, there is a way though uh, to impose a spatial scale uh, without nanostructuring. You can, instead of, uh, you know, uh, shaping your sample, you can shape light. So for example, and that's what uh, we do, you can cross two laser pulses, you form an interference pattern. And then you uh, set up a periodic uh, temperature profile in your sample, and the heat transport will take uh, place between the maxima and minima of this uh, temperature grating, we call it thermal grating. Uh, you can change this period simply by changing the angle between your pulses, very convenient. Uh, so this is uh, everything uh, take place in your sample of interest, no other materials, no interfaces involved. Now, now how, then how do you measure that? How do you find out what's going on here? Uh, instead of placing many tiny sensors uh, inside a sample, we use another laser pulse. So you see uh, the temperature variation will also uh, modulate optical properties. So the, your sample with the thermal grating in it will uh, act as a diffraction grating for our probe pulse. So our probe pulse will diffract, we can monitor this diffraction. And even though we cannot measure temperature in every point in our sample, um, the, the magnitude of this diffracted signal will tell us uh, what the magnitude of our temperature grating is. So we can 
uh, we can then watch how this temperature gradient decays uh, by uh, you know a thermal transport. Okay, now uh, uh, for for theoreticians among you, <laughs> um, this is also a very nice uh, you know a very nice experiment uh, in terms of uh, uh, opportunities for theoretical analysis. Um, Traditionally, people who looked at the uh, uh, thermal transport uh, at, uh, at the nanoscale, they like this, uh, this problem where you have a slab of material bounded by black body walls. And then they make the slab thinner and they see what happens, right? So this, uh, uh, this um, uh, has never been done experimentally because there are no black body walls for phonons to begin with. And, and this is also a hard problem. In fact, there are no analytical solutions. Even in the, in the simple, if you make approximations like relax, relaxation time approximation. Uh, he, here with the thermal gradient, uh, we don't have any walls. We have everything uh, in, in our infinite sample. Uh, and then uh, the, 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 the spatial sinusoidal dependence, that's the simplest spatial dependence you can get. So that's a single Fourier component. Uh, so that's uh, the, the easiest temperature profile if, uh, in terms of the theoretical analysis. And uh, in fact, indeed, uh, the exact solutions of the uh, Boltzmann transport equation, or uh, rather it's called Pyrrhus Boltzmann transport equation performance uh, have been obtained for, uh, for this journey. Uh, now I would like to show you some examples of our past work. Uh, so here uh, we have a silicon sample at room temperature, and um, we change the period of our thermal gradient, and we see how it decays. Uh, and of course, we, we make the period smaller, and it decays faster. And the diffusion model tells us that uh, the decay time should be proportional to the length, the period squared, time scales with the square of the distance. Or the decay rate should scale uh, with the square of the inverse distance. We call it the uh, thermal gradient wave vector. And this is indeed what's observed, but then you make the period even smaller and you see that the dependence deviates from this uh, linear trend predicted by the diffusion model. And this is uh, basically a direct evidence of, uh, of non-diffusive transport, not yet ballistic, but clearly deviates from the uh, diffusion model. And this um, happens uh, at fairly large distances. So here the, the uh, smallest uh, transgressing period is uh, Two and a half microns, which means the effective heat transfer distances on the order of a micron. Uh, so this was at the time surprising because there are solid state uh, physics textbooks which uh, list uh, the mean phonon mean free path in silicon at room temperature at about 40 nanometers. So one would think uh, then that at one micron everything should be diffusive. Um, not really, because obviously phonons don't have a single mean free path. There is there is a spectrum on of phonon mean free path and uh, this deviation from the diffusive behavior indeed starts uh, already uh, at the micron scale. Uh, so another even uh, uh, a more recent uh, example here is uh, uh, a similar experiment on graphite. And you see here, instead of a monotonous decay of the thermal gradient, we have, uh, you know, damped oscillations. Uh, so here, the uh, our sinusoidal uh, Profiles, which is science. So we, where we had maximum before, now we have minimum. And this basically means that heat uh, propagates as a wave, so to speak. And indeed, um, uh, what we see here is a second sound. This is not room temperature, but a fairly high temperature. So previously, um, what, what I have shown you, so the fluoride, the, the temperatures were uh, much lower. And again, this is a direct uh, observation, we can uh, we can see the effect immediately in the in the raw data, and um, uh, here is the theory. The agreement actually is not as the the, the qualitative agreements there, uh, but um, uh, not exactly quantitative, I would say. Okay, so uh, now what's the problem with this? This is not uh, not uh, not a nanoscale measurement. This is a microscale measurement. Uh, as you can see, here is the periods of the of our thermal gradient. Here is in the micron range from uh, ten to seven to twenty-four microns here. Uh, and why uh, um, uh, why can't we push this into the nanoscale? Because there is a limit imposed by the wavelength of light. Uh, so we cannot make an interference pattern with a period smaller than half the wavelength. That's a hard limit. Uh, and our 
optical wavelengths, it's typically half a micron. So the smallest period we can produce will be sub-micron, uh, hundreds and the hundreds of the nanometer range. Um, now, it would be nice to you know, have a shorter wavelength, uh, but up until recently, the lasers with shorter wavelengths weren't available. A shorter wavelength would be uh, extreme ultraviolet or, or X-rays. Uh, and, uh, you know, 35 years ago, uh, Vitaly Lazarus Ginzburg in his book on physics and astrophysics uh, listed uh, an X-ray laser as one of the grand challenges. And, and here this uh, now, uh, this one grand challenge, uh, uh, one grand problem from, from his book has been solved. So indeed, so for the past decade, they have um, lasers. And in fact, Ginsburg was uh, correctly identified free electron lasers uh, as a possible path uh, to, uh, to X-ray lasers. So they have free electron lasers operating in, in X-ray and extreme ultraviolet regimes. So uh, these are big things. Uh, so this is uh, a free electron laser in Trieste, Italy. So this is the, the accelerator. Yellow is the accelerator. The red is the laser itself. And the blue is the external hole one where we do the experiments. Uh, and uh, at this facility, uh, the, the, uh, this is not quite X-ray. So the wavelength range is uh, 4 to 100 nanometers. So this is the from soft X-ray to to extreme ultraviolet, but still much shorter, so 10 to 100 times shorter compared to the uh, optical, visible optical range. Um, okay, so uh, at this facility, there was a dedicated effort um, on, on building a transgrading setup. So it took uh, from the conception of the idea, it took um, about uh, eight years uh, to construct. So it looks easy here, but uh, you see this is the actual design. Uh, uh, each tank is a, is a separate vacuum chamber. Uh, the whole tank is about 10 meters long. Uh, and finally, uh, just a few years ago, it started working. Uh, so here are the first measurements. Uh, so that's silicon nitrate. And you can see the oscillations here. Uh, the oscillations here is not heat transport. So this is an acoustic wave. Uh, we see it in optical experiments too. It's just that um, extreme ultraviolet probe is, is more sensitive to it. So the oscillations is simply an acoustic wave, a coherent phonon, we, we call it. So this acoustic wave that we launch. Uh, uh, but uh, there is also uh, a slow component. And the slow component is, is the stomal grating, which, uh, which then the case. Um, now, in silicon nitrate, there's amorphous. Uh, so if we look at thermal transport, we find that thermal transport, even at this distance scale, uh, is perfectly diffusive. So the, the uh, decay uh, rate uh, scales as the square of the, uh, of the wave vector. So no surprises here. This means that the mean free path of the heat carriers uh, must be smaller than um, about 9 nanometers, which is reasonable for, for an amorphous material. Uh, now, acoustic waves are also of interest. This is basically a way to generate very high frequency coherent phonons. Here, the frequency you see goes up to 0.4, almost up to 0.4 terahertz, and we can push it, it even further into, into the terahertz range. So that's another, another thing uh, that uh, could be used to, to uh, uh, investigate, investigate very high frequency phones. Um, OK. Now, how about silicon? So we could hope that if we use this uh, approach on, on a single crystal silicon, we can actually see the transition all the way to almost purely ballistic regime. Uh, now, the first experiment we, we, we have done uh, at this facility on silicon was uh, at, at that time, we didn't have an extreme ultraviolet probe. So the excitation was done with uh, an extreme ultraviolet wavelength, 13 nanometers, but the probe was still optical. Uh, so we could generate very small periods uh, of uh, thermal gratings with very small periods, but we, uh, we could not probe them because um, uh, optical beam with 400 nanometers wavelength would not diffract uh, of a grating with a very small period. Uh, so uh, therefore, in this experiment, the period was uh, 280 nanometers. I mean, still quite small, but not, not very small, uh, which means that the, the 
So basically, that's the period, but uh, the, the, the heat flows from the maxima to the minima, which is half period. And the, you can show that the effects of heat transfer distance is uh, the period divided by pi. So th this is about 100 nanometers uh, heat transfer distance in this case. And that's the experimental result. By the way, we, we, we also do see acoustic waves here, you see, but they're just not as prominent because the optical probe um, is uh, sensitive to the temperature itself. Uh, whereas um, the extreme ultraviolet probe is mostly sensitive to the modulations of, of density. Uh, we also see the electronic signal here, which we don't see with um, an extreme ultraviolet probe. But anyway, so that's, that's this uh, thermal decay here. And the yellow curve shows uh, the predic prediction by the heat equation. Uh, and um, uh, previously, you, you, uh, we have seen that when we do it, uh, uh, you know, but, uh, on our optical setup, we just see, uh, you know, a moderate deviation from the diffusive behavior. Uh, here, you know, the difference is huge. So obviously the actual decay is much slower than the diffusion model predicts. And the blue curve is a Boltzmann transport equation calculation, uh, first principles, no fitting parameters. Uh, so basically you can just take foreign scattering rates uh, calculated from, you know, the potentials obtained with dense functional theory and uh, yeah, you get a fairly good agreement. Uh, this is still not um, uh, uh, in the ballistic regime though, because if we calculate the ballistic, uh, the TKV ballistic transport, it would be faster. Uh, so we are not uh, at, the, at the ballistic limit yet. And by the way, just uh, again for the theoreticians here, I, I would like to mention that <laughs> you know, obviously <laughs> calculating any tank in the ballistic regime is difficult because uh, <laughs> the ballistic regime means there is no that there are no um, unharmonic interactions. But if there are no unharmonic interactions, there is no mechanism to establish the thermal equilibrium initial state. Uh, so here, this calculation assumes that we start from thermal equilibrium at room temperature. Uh, but there is a contradiction here, right? Because uh, if time is too short for the phonons to interact, we cannot uh, establish this thermal equilibrium. So then the question is, uh, we really need to look at the you know, details of the excitation. Uh, with uh, our laser, we excite the electronic system for us, then the uh, excited carriers relax, they transfer energy to phonons. So we should actually look to which phonon modes the energy is transferred. So this is not, not as simple. Uh, but so anyway, uh, so this is uh, our uh, most recent, very recent um, result where we finally managed to do an experiment with extreme ultraviolet pump and probe. Uh, so the, the grazing period is uh, 70 nanometers. Um, that is the heat transfer distance on the order of uh, 20, micro, uh, 20 nanometers. Uh, the the uh, diffusion mole prediction yellow here. So at this point, doesn't make any sense. So the, the diffusion mole predicts uh, the, the um, uh, relaxation time of under one picosecond, but under one picosecond, the, the phonons just can't go anywhere. So they can only, you know, uh, it's the, the, the for the longitudinal phonons, the speed of sound is uh, eight nanometers per picosecond. So th they can't just, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not possible for this short time uh, for heat to propagate, physically impossible. Um, um, now, uh, we don't have any theory here yet, but you can immediately see that indeed we are approaching the ballistic uh, regime of heat transparent. Why you can see that? Uh, you can see that the decay of the thermal gradient is comparable to the acoustic period. And the acoustic period is the time of flight uh, for the longitudinal acoustic phonons uh, to get over one period of the gradient. So we see that the time scale is the same, similar. So the heat propagates almost uh, with the speed of sound. Uh, okay, so yeah, we'll have the analysis very soon. Stay tuned. And um, how, are we, how are we doing with time? So I think in the interest of time, I, I'll just skip uh, uh, the remaining uh, two slides. And then I would like to um, thank my collaborators at MIT and also at the Fermi Letra in Trieste. Uh, and um, thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much for such an interesting talk to bring us back to reality. That's much appreciated. I was informed uh, that spontaneously uh, an extra credit of 10 minutes will be given for questions since uh, we do not have many experimental talks. And I'm sure there will be a lot of questions from the podium. I'm also quite certain that I and Professor Kriftsov and Alex Sokolov will be in touch with you to discuss it in private. So anyway, uh, without further ado, questions from St. Petersburg, please. Mr. Magnus, I thank you for the presentation. Open please uh, slide number 18. Uh, say it again. You're very hard to hear. Can you speak up? Uh, open please uh, slide number 18. No. Can you approach the computer in St. Petersburg? We cannot hear you. Yes, uh, can you please open slide 18? Ah. Yes, okay. Um. Uh, okay. Um, am I rightly understood uh, that uh, uh, you have measured uh, uh, phone on signal. Well, uh, we don't measure the phonons directly. What we measure is uh, <laughs> what we measure is thermal expansion. Uh, on, not really, right? So in this case, not really, right? So we measure the temperature, so to speak. We measure the optical properties, and we believe that the op optical properties, the the uh, sort of the uh, this grating of the optical properties of the refractive index reproduces the temperature. So I think we measure the decay of the of the temperature uh, of, of the sinus of the amplitude of the sinusoidal yeah. temperature profile. Uh, so you have measured uh, a temperature directly. Not directly, right? So again, we measure the change in the refractive index of the medium. And uh, how is this uh, variable uh, variable uh, was uh, uh, transformed to the to the temperature? Uh, well, we think that uh, you know, and the, the small perturbation limit is proportional. So uh, if if you if 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 you well, <laughs> here the, the perturbation was not really small. It was about 100 k, you know, heating, right? But uh, still small compared to 300 k. So for an experimentalist, that's a small perturbation. Uh, so we think that in the uh, small perturbation linear regime, uh, all changes will be proportional to temperature. Uh, so that, uh, however, the, what, what I'm plotting here, the, the signal, uh, the signal uh, is quadratic uh, with respect to the uh, to the refractive index change. So it's uh, what we are, what we measure here is is proportional to the amplitude of the temperature modulation squared. Okay, thank you. And uh, the second uh, last question, I haven't uh, understood uh, the divergence uh, between uh, experiment results and the red uh, ballistic curve. Maybe the Boltzmann transport equation uh, has, uh, has uh, this equation uh, and the right uh, part of uh, integral collision, collision term or not. Uh, yes, the blue one, the blue one, the, the Boltzmann transport equation. Yes, it does have the collision term, but the red one does not. So that's the difference, right? So if you eliminate the collisions, you get the red curve. With collisions, you have the blue curve. Uh, okay. And the collisions, this is, uh, again, just to caution you, this is the relaxation time approximation. Uh, so this is uh, basically you you just get uh, take sketching if uh, sketching rate for a given phonon mode. So you don't um, uh, don't uh, you know treat the details of the phonon for uh, phonon phonon interactions. But um, uh, now it is also possible to uh, to solve the Boltzmann transport equation with the full sketching matrix, which um, actually accounts for the three phonon. Um, uh, discussion uh, corrected. Okay, thank you very much. 
other further questions in St. Petersburg or maybe here at the online or from the online audience? Uh, may I ask a question? I will come closer to the computer. Yes, please come closer. Yes, uh, am I close enough? No. It's wonderful. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mazny, for your very interesting presentation. And actually, I will continue the question by Sergey. So what seems to be a little bit unexpected in this uh, picture is that your ballistic curve doesn't have any oscillations. Uh, yes, this is, uh, well, we, we, start, uh, we start with thermal equilibrium distribution at 300K. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are, first of all, three, three phonon modes plus optical phonons, right? And mm -hmm. there is also dispersion. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, so if you, uh, if you are, let's say, at low temperatures and uh, single, uh, if you have a single phonon mode, of course, you would expect to see very prominent oscillations. If you uh, consider three phonon modes, the oscillations will be already sort of your average robust, you know, three phonon modes, but with the dispersion, uh, the oscillations go away. Mm. Well, no, in this case, I, I don't really understand it because uh, if, if I understand, uh, well, what kind of dispersion relation you insert into this uh, model? Well, the actual dispersion, the dispersion, actual dispersion relations for phonons and silicon. Uh -huh. So it has like, uh, Six uh, branches, right? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Ah, so in this case, it's um, and uh, how do you assume uh, the what, what distribution of energy among the mod do you assume? In this I will start with the thermal equilibrium distribution. Thermal equilibrium. And, and of course, for the ballistic calculations, this is <laughs> you know, as I as I said, <laughs> this is. Uh, <laughs> And uh, there is a contradiction inside the mall, right? Because if you say the transport is ballistic, right? Then there is no mechanism to establish a, a thermal equilibrium distribution to begin yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, I understand. But, I'm but, just asking from... For, for comparison, because the blue curve was also calculated here, starting with the thermal distribution. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Because the reason I'm asking is that in all our simulations, when we compute this uh, for any dispersion curve in one, two, or three dimensions, we always have oscillations. So uh, I don't actually understand uh, why, you, why you don't think, have. Uh, you know, I think part of some of your oscillations that I have seen uh, in your oscillations, there. Yeah, they were of, of a different nature. So, for example, when you start with velocities, mm -hmm. right, uh, then you just have the oscillations, which are basically sort of phonons, right, because the energy then goes, uh, you have the fast redistribution uh, so from the, uh, so you actually excite coherence. So you, you act, you, you know, you, you, you have oscillations because uh, the energy moves from, you know, kinetic to, to potential. Mm -hmm. Uh, degrees of freedom, right? So this this is not happening here because this is thermal equilibrium already, uh, right? Um, so that's one thing, right? So of course there are also oscillations uh, related to sort of uh, phonon group velocity. So mm -hmm. basically, yeah, you start from uh, uh, spatial sinusoidal population, and yes, this is three dimensional. So they uh, they go in all directions. So the projection of the group velocity on the sort of the uh, the grating direction. Uh, is different, but you would see oscillations. That is, if uh, if you have you know the bimodal with a single phonon branch, constant group velocity, uh, mm -hmm. with those calculations, we see oscillations for sure. Mm -hmm. but for the uh, real uh, dispersion and silicon, we do not. But, okay. but again, this, is, this is Boltzmann transport equation, right? So this is not. So we are not doing the thing you do, right? Because you actually solve the equations of motion. Yeah, but in uh, the ballistic limit, they actually give uh, right, right, no, an identical result. Yes, yeah. yes, I agree. So we could look at it. Yeah, I think it would be very interesting to discuss more. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much for coming. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I very much like your, your talk. I love your curves, but they look too good to be true. So I 
would like to see the details of how they were calculated. I'm sure we will be in touch and we will talk uh, about more interesting methods of solution of the Boltzmann transfer equation, the ballistic one and the heat equation. Yeah, the heat equation, I believe it's smooth, but the rest, I cannot really believe it right now. So I have to understand how you did that. Thank you very much. Anyway, I'm sure we will be in touch. And uh, let's give our speaker a very big hand and great applause. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, um, then we finally come to our last speaker or speakers. Um, it's again a presentation from uh, the Russian Federation from Peter the Great, St. Petersburg Polytechnic University. And uh, the speaker will be Andrei Urachev and it's a co-authored paper with Professor Anton Kristitsov. The title is Thermal and Diffusion Processes in One-Dimensional Crystal. Please, the podium is yours. Uh, hello. Uh, I would like to tell you about my, part of my PhD thesis. Um, to dedicate it to non functionary thermal process in one dimensional crystal. Uh, the model uh, which under consideration is uh, one dimensional markers connected by uh, rings. Uh, in the case of uh, a harmonic string, uh, the equation dynamics uh, can be right in this form. Uh, these uh, strings uh, can be imagined as. Um, Harmonic oscillators or uh, unharmonic oscillators. Uh, the, the, the example in the nature uh, of this chain is the carbine. Uh, carbine usually is very unstable material, but uh, recently uh, the group of uh, scientists uh, find a stable form of carbine. Uh, in, this, in, in the experiments, uh, carbine is protected by. Um, carbon nanotubes, uh, and this form uh, was, uh, was, very, was very stable, and, uh, um, so, and so uh, uh, we can say about uh, these topics, and, and the study, the study is whatever. Uh, the, uh, the study uh, carbine, uh, the study of uh, one-dimensional crystals, has a great story, story uh, one of the first scientists who uh, research, who study uh, dynamics of one-dimensional crystals is um, uh, Erwin Schrodinger. Uh, he found that uh, dynamics of any particles uh, is described uh, by a via beta function. Uh, 40 years ago, uh, Ilya Prigozhin uh, uh, studied uh, energy oscillation in this system, and uh, he found that uh, energy oscillation uh, is described uh, Bessel function too. Uh, but uh, where Vox is not uh, uh, is very uh, is uh, is not is unknown because uh, uh, Erwin Schrödinger wrote uh, this paper in uh, German. Uh, and uh, Yevgeny Gorzhin uh, wrote his, uh, his paper in French, and uh, uh, and uh, the most of scientists do not know about his paper. Uh, but uh, I would like to tell you that Friedrich uh, uh, Bessel is uh, not only mathematician; uh, he was astronomer, and uh, he was a first uh, scientist who found uh, distance between. Uh, sun and uh, any star. Uh, this star, star was um, uh, 61 tiny, tiny uh, and uh, he uh, opened uh, eyes uh, to human uh, what uh, distance, uh, uh, cosmic distance, on, on cosmic distance. Uh, 40 years, uh, 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 several years ago, Alan Tadisley and uh, Rick Tadia. Um, energy oscillation in molecular chain, uh, but uh, he, he found that uh, energy oscillates, but uh, uh, don't know why. Uh, 
in uh, this, uh, our age, uh, 20, 20, uh, 20th century, uh, group of group group of scientists found that uh, uh, energy 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 that like in the pro, pro, uh, uh, protein uh, chain. Protein chain. Uh, in uh, 2014, uh, Kripsov uh, found analytical solution in uh, harmonic chain and found that uh, temperature can be temperature related by the function. Uh, so well, this part is very um, has a great story, uh, has a great history, and my uh, research is defeated on two topics. Can it temperature oscillation in finite crystals and uh, oscillation can it temperature in uh, geek alpha two crystals? Uh, this, uh, uh, my uh, initial conditions, uh, in this type of initial conditions, uh, this definition of, of kinetic temperature. Uh, and I, would, I would like to know that uh, kinetic temperature uh, is proportional to uh, kinetic energy. And uh, the uh, and the uh, in, in initial moment of time, potential energy is zero, and uh, kinetic energy is uh, uh, is not zero, is constant and not, not zero constant. Uh, after after any perturbation, the crystal uh, has. Uh, so the crystal transits to no uh, in initial moment of time crystals uh, in uh, non uh, the non equilibrium state and uh, after uh, and after it transits to equilibrium state. These transition processes uh, uh, we can we can observe uh, some effects, uh, some phenomena. Uh, in, uh, the first phenomena is that. The velocity distribution tends to go down, and uh, uh, energy crystals uh, and the kinetic uh, total energy redistributed redi between uh, kinetic energy and potential energy. Uh, what I, uh, what uh, not, not in this slide you can see. Uh, uh, Kinetic energy, kinetic temperature in finite crystals. Uh, you can see Bessel function, but the, but uh, after a certain moment of time, you can see uh, a jump in amplitude of, of oscillation. Uh, after uh, oscillations uh, became, uh, became more more complex. Uh, uh, after you can see an induced jump, and, uh, you, and these jumps uh, occur periodically. Why? Well, what happens? Uh, to solve this, uh, this uh, task, uh, this problem, uh, yeah, I use uh, covariance analysis, covariance is a mathematical expectation between to values, uh, to random uh, values, uh, and the uh, index of covariance is uh, um, corresponding to uh, distance between two particles. Uh, if you can see uh, equation of dynamics covariance, uh, uh, how you can see uh, these equations uh, is very similar to equation dynamics of particles in the thermal chain. Uh, uh, so, 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 covariance with zero index is proportional to kinetic temperature. So we can see, so we can find uh, temperature, uh, kinetic temperature, uh, and uh, we can, uh, and n is a finite number. So we can uh, we can rewrite this uh, uh, formula. In a uh, Hermann's Bessel function, uh, this, this, this formula uh, is very accurate, uh, and uh, we can uh, uh, e, 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 and uh, function uh, can write uh, can describe uh, can describe thermal uh, right. 
uh, if, if, if we uh, observe, if we can see this, this uh, sum, we, uh, we can, we, uh, can uh, we can write this sum in this form. Uh, how, how sum of several uh, several uh, terms. A uh, variable terms uh, is corresponding to Bessel function with a uh, uh, certain order. Uh, Bessel function zero order is uh, oscillation is a uh, oscillated function. Uh, but uh, second, uh, but Bessel function with even order is a uh, particular zero on certain moment of time, and after uh, it. Uh, it, uh, it um, oscillate with, uh, with decreasing amplitude. We sum this function get us uh, allow us to obtain uh, uh, function of uh, the oscillation function for kinetic temperature in finite crystal. Yeah, in the case of uh, infinite crystals. We can see only one the uh, one terms because this term is uh, uh, remains zero. What nature of uh, of uh, thermal set? Uh, the dynamics of crystals uh, is described by oscillations of every particle. Every particle uh, generate two waves, uh, left waves and right waves. What uh, meet each other on uh, uh, opposite side of the crystal. Uh, every, every waves from every particle meet each other in a one moment of time, and we can observe a uh, sharp of increased energy, uh, in, uh, sharp of uh, amplitude uh, kinetic energy. Uh, these uh, situations repeat uh, periodically, and we can see. Uh, uh, a sharp, uh, sharp jumps of amplitude uh, of amplitude of the kinetic energy. Uh, in, a, in the case, uh, in, the, in the slide, you can see a real crystal, uh, carbine with uh, 100 atoms, 1,000 uh, atoms, uh, and, uh, and perturbations, uh, initial perturbations, uh, 100 uh, degrees of Celsius, uh, Lead us to first remove echo with uh, amplitude five five uh, degrees of Celsius. Uh, the second topic is uh, dedicated to uh, transit processes in alpha a two crystal. Uh, we uh, the second term is very uh, is very small, and we can enter our our task to find. Uh, uh, a re relationship be between thermal process and mechanical process. In initial moment of time, our crystals uh, is deformed uh, instantly, and uh, we we want to found uh, uh, but uh, transit processes to new equilibrium state. If this, if this crystal was uh, harmonic, uh, trans, uh, trans, we don't. Uh, we don't see, we don't absorb uh, transit processes. Uh, 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 if our crystal has unharmonic of uh, springs, uh, this, pro this, pro this uh, process uh, can be absorbed. Uh, uh, if, if we use if 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 uh, we use uh, viral theorem, we can find uh, uh, kinetic temperature after. Uh, after loading on large time. Uh, in this photo, you can see the formula, the formulas uh, can be found from Virial theorem. But uh, Virial theorem uh, don't allow us to, to find uh, transit processes. How transit processes occur in, uh, happens in uh, this crystal. We use uh, for fine analytical solution. We use uh, our harmonic equation. Uh, we neglect we neglect uh, quadratic terms, uh, but uh, 
in these equations uh, remains uh, a harmonic term, uh, uh, terms uh, proportional to one harmonic, uh, harmonic coefficient. Uh, this equation is harmonic, and uh, we can find a uh, solution from uh, known, uh, known, uh, uh, known theory. Uh, in, in, you can see here uh, generalized uh, Lagrangian, uh, which proportional basic function. And, uh, and uh, this, this Lagrangian uh, proportional uh, Kinetic temperature, and we and, and after some advice, we can find the uh, kinetic temperature uh, in the uh, kinetic temperature as function of time. Uh, you can see uh, here uh, comparison with analytical solution and numerical solution. Uh, in, uh, in the case of uh, negative, uh, uh, alpha, uh, negative alpha, the temperature uh, in new temperature. Um, Low than uh, old temperature. Uh, in, in the real chain, uh, carbon chain, uh, well, the deformation uh, in one percent uh, to uh, uh, cre create change of, of temperature in one dot seven uh, degrees of Celsius. Okay. And thank you for attention. If you can, uh, any question, I would like to, to, to ask. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, yes, questions, please, from St. Petersburg or online questions. Finite uh, deformation speed is still in this uh, next part. I think we are just the I think uh, we are. Uh, uh, I um a very good question. Good question. I uh, calculate the, the situation numerically, and uh, in my results, the numerical results uh, say that uh, these oscillations. Uh, uh, has uh, uh, on, on, uh, we, 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 uh, the results was some uh, diagonal uh, the speed of um, uh, linear, linear and uh, and the better function yes uh, so, yes yes but uh, how, how we can uh, deformate uh, by, by step by step uh, function uh, this is the sum of uh, another function and the best function. Uh, when it becomes Are there further questions? If this is not so, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. And this brings us to our final presentation, I think. Um, it will be given by Ilna Murtasin, Melnikov, and Semyonov. Uh, the title is Simulation of Inelastic Response of Polycrystalline Nickel Based on Micromechanical Model Homogenization. Again, this is a presentation from Peter the Great and Petersburg Polytechnic University. Please start. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, 
I'm going to present you my short work, simulation of the elastic response of polyphenol based on the mechanical model. Uh, so uh, we are going to consider the experiment uh, where some specimen specimen uh, influenced by uh, by exploding. Uh, we should understand that the two ways we have uh, active loading. Uh, where our loading class is lying uh, beyond the yield surface. And we have passive loading where the opposite case. And uh, plastic flow theory says that uh, in this case, um, there is no, there are no plastic strains. But micro mechanical, microstructural models say that um, some plastic strain can be occurred. And this is our work. A uh, little bit about methodology and uh, plastic flow is uh, this assume that plastic flow uh, uh, occurs uh, when uh, plastic flow is carried out uh, as a result of possible flooding uh, along uh, one of 12. At least one of those sliding uh, directions in a vertical sliding uh, system. And in this slide, you can also see the decomposition of uh, the formation gradient, which is also about to be And uh, uh, in our microstructure or micromechanical model, we have both the tropic and kinematic hardening. And uh, this material constant uh, will be determined later in this presentation. Uh, now, uh, I would like to tell you about the research, uh, research object. We have a uh, tubular specimen, a uh, nickel tubular specimen that uh, influenced by axial force and social moment. And uh, this experiment was uh, carried out in 1962 by Izotov, and our aim is to uh, do the same thing, but uh, find numerical solution uh, using the Pantacarator finite element system. And we um, select the representative volume and uh, using the um, different number of subdivisions, uh, calculate this task. Uh, it is important moment that uh, that we consider different number of sub subdivisions because um, in our this little this, this small cube cube and this our this little cube uh, can contains uh, eight uh, Gauss Gaussian points which is uh, are presented like uh, one Gaussian point is a uh, one um, single crystal. And in this case, we have uh, eight, eight, uh, eight and eight uh, monocrystals mono in this, uh, in this polycrystal. And a uh, little bit about boundary conditions. We have uh, axial and we have static boundary conditions uh, where Excel and uh, torsion of Excel force and torsional moment uh, is written in terms of in term of uh, stress, and also we have uh, periodic conditions. It means that uh, each parallel side of this cube uh, connected by mm, connected by beam and in each node displacement uh, mm, uh, in each node, each node of, uh, has uh, the same displacement in different uh, degrees of freedom. And this is loading path. Uh, we uh, set tension and uh, torsion, compression, torsion, etc. And for this, we uh, obtain uh, material constants. Uh, this material constants uh, using the MATLAB curve fitting toolbox. We have experimental curve. And uh, we approximate this 
point by uh, two exponents. And uh, for micromechanical model, uh, for monocrystal micromechanical model, this uh, constant uh, gives sufficient uh, result. And but uh, using this constant for polycrystalline material, uh, we have uh, some differences. Uh, in this slide, you can see the loading curves. Uh, this is single crystal curve, red, orange, and and the blue uh, and green is a polycrystal. And uh, using uh, this constant and using the finite element uh, approach, we have uh, results and comparison with the experiment. Uh, in this slide, you can see the uh, deformation, deformation by X axis and the uh, shared deformation. And uh, as you can see, mm, the small number of subdivisions uh, demonstrates uh, a large spread of, uh, of the received values. So uh, mm, for this purpose, the dependent of the dispersion uh, of, on the number of subdivision was plotted. And with some conclusions, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Are you finished? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, questions from the audience in St. Petersburg, please. Are there any questions? There are no questions. I would like to ask you a question regarding your slide on page 12. Uh, you show us some material constants here for the plastic properties for the, uh, for the uh, plastic yield and the hardening. And I was wondering for your homogenization, do you not need the parameters for the various slip systems, the Schmidt parameters, in order to do a homogenization? Are these known for your system? Oh, I didn't consider this. Uh, we didn't consider this, but uh, we are going to do to do it. Okay, thank you. Any further comments, questions? Also from the online people. I'm sorry, I do not see any. So thank you very much again for your presentation. Thank you. And uh, yes, so this brings me to the end of the session. I would like to thank all our speakers. I think we saw some fascinating theory, th theoretical work in uh, anomalous heat conduction and also a very nice presentation on possible experiments. So um, uh, the future will tell how further we can go. And thanks for all, to all participants. And I hope to see you again after this session in other sessions and in the main presentations in the plenary lectures. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Bye-bye.